We think differently. I think we can um, we can just uh, quickly refer to uh, to his personality, and to this respect, um, I would um, invite our colleague Miss Rola to uh, read out um, the biography of the uh, Prime Minister of Norway. Sure, thank you very much, Professor Anis. Um, hello, everyone. <clears throat> this is Rola, and I'm the Information Officer with IFMS. Uh, so uh, our guest for today is His Excellency Kjell Maune Bonivik, and I'm going to read you his uh, biography. So as a leader of the Christian Democratic Party, he served as the Prime Minister of Norway for two terms from 1997 to 2000 and 2001 to 2005. That makes him the longest serving non-labor prime minister in Norway since the end of World War II. Among other functions in his paramount political career, he served as the education minister as well as the foreign minister under the government of Prime Minister Jan Seitz, as well as the deputy prime minister under the government of Prime Minister Kor Willuk. He was a member of parliament in the Norwegian National Parliament from 1973 to 2005, as well as His Excellency Bondevik was leading the Christian Democratic Party of Norway from 1983 to 1995, which is considered the second strongest political front in the country. Since leaving the prime minister's office, His Excellency has been leading the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights as its founder and president. The purpose of the center is to work for world peace, human rights, and interreligious religious tolerance worldwide. The center cooperates closely with the Carter Center in Atlanta, the Kim Dae-jung Library in Seoul, and the Crisis Management Initiative in Helsinki. Interestingly, uh, Jan Peterson, former Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Bondevik government and chair of the Norwegian Conservative Party, was a guest of Professor Anise 10 years ago as well, in November 2011, and he was giving a lecture, a uh, public lecture to students and faculty members while serving as the Norway's ambassador in Austria and Vienna-based international organizations. Uh, this was his biography, and um, thank you for your patience. Let's just wait a little bit more until he shows up. Uh, I'm sure that this lecture would be worthy of your time. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Roland. So uh, uh, for those of you who are not much, uh, let's say, familiar with the, with the, with the Nordic countries, uh, practically uh, most of the Nordic countries are um, co constitutional or parliamentary monarchies, uh, which means that actually head of state, uh, head of state is, um, is a non-elected president, but it's the, the monarch uh, who comes to power, not by the force of elections, but by uh, so-called hereditary causa. And uh, traditionally, uh, uh, for the last uh, uh, hundred years, uh, those countries, primarily Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Norway, uh, were contrabalancing this fact that uh, they are constitutional monarchies, and they've been run by, let's say, left to the uh, left from center political parties. So, uh, especially in Sweden and in Norway, uh, practically it was dominated the, let's say, the the political. Um, uh, arena has been dominated by parties which are uh, left from the center. So traditionally, those were the social democrats. And um, uh, in case of our today's guest, actually, he was the longest, as uh, as uh, we have heard from uh, from Rola um, uh, uh, elaborating on his uh, CV. Uh, he was actually the longest serving non-social democratic. Um, uh, prime Minister, so coming from, let's say, right to the center, right center, uh, which usually occupies, uh, which is usually occupied in, in, in European political spectrum by, by Christian Democrats, um, uh, uh, as opposed to the social Democrats who are left center. Also interesting thing is that uh, uh, Norway um, had a so-called uh, peaceful divorce from Sweden. So the, today's uh, Sweden and Norway were one country, and then they had the so-called peace divorce in which actually uh, heir to the throne of uh, Norway has been taken from the Danish branch. So there is a, there is a let's say, a, a stronger connection between the Danish 
uh, royal family and the Norwegian one. Uh, the other, so those are of the Nordic uh, uh, group countries, those are the monarchies, so it's Denmark, it's Sweden, and it's, um, it's uh, Norway. And then we have the Republican type of the countries, which is then going with the Finland, because Finland is a republic that has a, a elected president, and Iceland. Iceland was a territory that has been dominated by, let's say, Nordics as a sort of, uh, let's say, colony. Uh, the Faroe Islands and the, and the Greenland and uh, Iceland were, were taken by, let's say, those uh, continental powers and uh, dominated by them. So right now, uh, Iceland is also a republic, is independent, is not in a possession of Norway or Denmark. Uh, while the Farao Islands, which are, well, let's say, uh, further north from the, from the northern uh, Europe, it's an uh, archipelago country, it's, uh, it's still nominally under the Danish crown or the, or the Danish, uh, let's say, uh, sovereignty. And there is a Grenland, uh, a largest island, uh, uh, which is under the ice. And that is, that is practically also a part of the former um, or, uh, Danish overseas possessions. Uh, another interesting thing about Norway, and the language is, is, is rather, rather uh, close to each other, of course, we call those languages Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian, and Icelandic language, but it belongs to the same narrow family of languages. And uh, besides the Iceland, uh, which requires a little bit more and effort to understand, the other three languages, uh, the people of the three language uh, group can more or less understand each other very well. They can read newspapers, they can follow news. So Danish, Swedes, and Norwegians, they can basically communicate. So. So the languages are not too far from each other. Uh, another interesting thing about Norway is, um, is that um, Norwegians were uh, uh, mid-90s or uh, early to mid-90s uh, after the end of the uh, uh, Cold War. They've been um, going into accession talks with uh, that time EU-12 because EU in the early 90s, during the Maastricht times of the Maastricht Treaty of 1992, uh, uh, EU was only uh, comprised of 12 members. So uh, three uh, Nordic countries and one Central European country uh, were going into accession talks. So that was Austria, Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And uh, all chapters uh, of the EU accession uh, talks have been closed by all four parties or all four countries. And then practically that opened the road for all four countries to join the EU. Uh, but the referendum has been held in uh, Norway and Norwegians, uh, uh, the Norwegian population has been rejecting actually to join the union. And uh, the referendum has been repeated after uh, with the same result. So that makes Norway the only country in Europe that was uh, actually successfully closing all chapters and passing all accession criteria, but not joining, not joining the union. So um, um, they remain in the grouping of so-called EFTA countries together with Switzerland. Now, uh, formerly uh, Great Britain was also part of EFTA. Uh, now, most probably uh, Britain will, will also go. So there is a cooperation link on, on, on matters of economy, trade, commerce, and uh, uh, customs. So the, those are the, the links between the EU, especially of the Schengen zone, and of the EFTA countries, Norway being one. And there is also, there are different associations. Uh, uh, one of them is the so-called Nordic Union, in which actually, interestingly enough, Norway uh, is a part together with Switzerland, Norway is a part of the Schengen Agreement. Schengen, one of the agreements that are uh, creating a closer links uh, within the member states of the EU um, is um, so-called monetary union. There are certain prerequisites how to come to so-called um, uh, 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 join uh, or common currency of the EU. And this is so-called Eurozone. Uh, so uh, there is a, a, a European Union, but Eurozone are the countries that are sharing the currency. And there is another interesting, uh, uh, pro, uh, let's say, um, 
uh, undertaking or um, a treaty that uh, puts uh, EU member states even uh, into a closer uh, cooperation, nearly federalizing them. And this is so-called Schengen Agreement. Schengen Agreement is agreement in which actually countries are mutually abolishing borders uh, uh, between each other. And as you, most of you know, when you travel from practically from Portugal to Finland, uh, you would see that, uh, I mean, before the, uh, the current measures with the pandemic um, uh, programs uh, of, uh, related to, to COVID. So uh, previously you can just drive the car without any border control, so you can move freely. So, and that was the notion of the Schengen provision, free movement of goods, of capital, of ideas and of people. So interestingly, Norway, together also with Switzerland, is a part of Schengen. They are not part of the EU, but they are part of Schengen. So practically, when, when you um, uh, uh, get visa or when, when you are within the, uh, the EU parameter of the Schengen zone, uh, uh, member countries of the EU, you can freely travel to Switzerland and there are also no border control uh, between, for example, France and Switzerland or, or, or Italy and Switzerland and so on and so forth. And the same applies also to Norway. Uh, there are connections, uh, for example, between Denmark and uh, Norway and practically there is, no, there is no border control. Of course, Norway is not in Eurozone as, as, as this is exclusive right for the EU member states. And out of the Baltic countries, it's Finland. So Sweden is not Sweden is not in the in the the um, uh, eurozone. So interestingly, so Norve uh, the Nordic group, uh, which is uh, uh, which uh, shares the same family, same geography, uh, same uh, let's say history, and and cultural background, uh, uh, we have uh, different countries in there. Some are republican type, some are monarchies. Then we have uh, Finland, which is uh, practically Eurozone in, in Schengen. Then we have Norway, a country that has fulfilled all criteria to join the Union, but they have never joined the Union. And then the Iceland, which uh, uh, during the previous government, if I'm not mistaken, no, uh, two governments bef be uh, before, so not the previous, but the one before that, uh, they've been the only government, uh, to my knowledge, that were uh, uh, signaling some preparedness to, to consider joining the Union. But one of the main issues were when, when it comes to Iceland, uh, which is shared by many Nordic countries or the Northern portion of European uh, countries, uh, the main issue for them was the fishery because Iceland is traditionally turned as an island country, is turned to, to fishery. So um, they anticipated basically uh, they, they suppose that uh, EU will not be uh, soft and uh, uh, receptive to their views, uh, rather rigid views uh, for the fishery. And then basically the idea of joining the union is not popular among them. So, so this government, uh, uh, as well as the previous governments of the, of the Iceland, were not even contemplating the uh, joining of the union. So that means that basically in this corner of the, of the globe, which, which is very proud of its neutrality and is not much visible. So they, they keep low profile in, on international scene as a good shepherd. So there is a lot of uh, activities and, and interesting, let's say, political setups that are, that are taking place. So as we said, so they are uh, uh, among the Nordic countries, they are countries which are absolutely, uh, let's say, integrated in the EU, be it in the Schengen or Eurozone, there are countries that are just in the EU. There are countries that have passed, um, um, uh, let's say, all accession criteria to join the Union, but they rejected a referendum to join. And also there are countries like Iceland, uh, which are basically not even like Switzerland and, and Iceland, they are even not contemplating to, to join the Union. But they are, they are trying to, to, let's say, to articulate their, uh, their um, other interest uh, in a most uh, cohesive and uh, let's say constructive way with the EU, but definitely definitely keeping away. So uh, as the saying goes, everything but the institution, institutions. So that means that they are going into, they are very receptive to any uh, links and uh, uh, joining of the, of the let's say, 
processes that are helping and facilitating trade and, and uh, exchanges, but they are not going into institutional, let's say, um, uh, into institutional um, uh, agreements and, and joining uh, joining the union. So that's that's the little peculiarity of the of the Norway. Uh, so we are still not getting uh, excellency, but uh, let us hope because um, um, if uh, I hope everything is fine, you know. So times are very uh, uh, peculiar and odd. I hope that there is no illness or anything else uh, in case. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm still optimistic because there is no note on on, on any cancellation of the of the lecture. And we had uh, we had uh, uh, exchanges up to this morning, and Excellency uh, Prime Minister was uh, really happy to join us uh, to to at, at this occasion and to talk to to all of you. So I hope we will have we will have him with us in uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, if if any of uh, while we are waiting, if any of you is interested in anything additional uh, on the Norway, uh, uh, please um, uh, uh, signal uh, your interest. And I see that uh, that uh, many participants have joined, uh, so. Uh, I would suggest uh, eventually that uh, Miss Rola uh, goes over his CV once more, if not the travel. For those who are joining us uh, a little bit later today, so so Miss Rola, if you can um, uh, go through the Excellency Prime Minister's um, uh, CV once more. I hope Rola is still there. So, uh, yes, I was just unable to unmute myself because, okay, um, okay. yeah, oh, okay. sure, yeah, I can go. So over once it. more, yes, once, yeah. one, once more, because I see that many people have joined in, in, in the last 10, 15 minutes. Okay, please. Yes. So, um, our guest for today is His Excellency Kiel Mane Bonevik. As a leader of the Christian Democratic Party, he served as Prime Minister of Norway for two terms from 1997 to 2000 and 2001 to 2005. That makes him the longest serving non-labor Prime Minister in Norway since the end of World War II. Among other functions in his paramount political career, he served as the Education Minister as well as the Foreign Minister under the government of Prime Minister Jan Seis, as well as Deputy Prime Minister under the government of Prime Minister Kor Willuk. He was a member of parliament in the Norwegian National Parliament from 1973 to 2005. His Excellency Bonnevik was leading the Christian Democratic Party of Norway from 1983 to 1995, which is considered the strongest, the second strongest political front in the country. Since leaving the prime minister's office, His Excellency has been leading the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights as its founder and president. The purpose of the center is to work for world peace, human rights, and interreligious tolerance worldwide. The center cooperates closely with the Carter Center in Atlanta, the Kim Dae Jung Library in Seoul, and the Crisis Management Initiative in Helsinki. Interestingly, Jan Peterson, former Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Bondevik government and chair of the Norwegian Conservative Party, was a guest uh, of Professor Anis 10 years ago in November 2011. He was giving a public lecture to students and um, faculty members while serving as the Norway's ambassador in Austria and Vienna-based international organizations. Um, Professor Anis. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was for those uh, who joined us later. Uh, so uh, please, uh, if, you can, if you have uh, some comments or questions related to Norway generally, I hope that uh, that uh, for those of you not uh, much, uh, let's say, uh, related to the Nordic countries, uh, it was informative. Um, another interesting thing is uh, that um, Arctic Circle, so there is a North Pole and, uh, and the Southern Pole, uh, both are important because they are the, the, the largest um, reserves of the fresh water on the planet because fresh reserves, you know, out of all waters that we have, uh, and very often uh, planet Earth is, uh, is referred as a green planet. Uh, 
that actually our planet is blue, is not green, because uh, more than two thirds of the surface of the planet is actually covered by waters. And the uh, waters, as we know, are not green, they are blue. Uh, so from the outside, our planet would be blue, or not, uh, or white blue because of the clouds, but really green. And two thirds of the planet are covered, as we say, over two, three, two thirds of the planet are covered by, by all waters. But out of, of all those waters that we have on the planet, 96% of waters is not potable or drinkable water. Those are either contaminated or inaccessible waters or the waters which, which are having a high salinity. So the oceanic waters we can't use for drinking. So we call it, it's not potable water, it's a eventually technical water. And, uh, and then out of this 4% of water that, that is drinkable, accessible and uh, potable water, actually most of water uh, are, are, are placed on the north and the southern pole, which are, as we know, uh, the permafrosts. So they are permanently frozen and they keep uh, uh, those two caps, polar caps are keeping actually most of the waters. So the polar caps are not important only as a geographic, but also as the magnetic poles of our planet, because our planet has two poles, which enables many uh, uh, other things as the circulation of oceans, the patterns of ocean, and also circulation of air is the following. So the southern pole is actually uh, an uh, continent surrounded by the sea and the North Pole, it's easy to remember, and the North Pole is sea surrounded by the, by the land. This is a fundamental difference. In the Southern Pole you have penguins and in the Northern Pole you have polar bears. You know, they are like all normal brown bears, but they are just white because everything around is white. So those are, let's say, peculiarities and differences. So the Arctic is very remote place. It's very cold place. It's actually the coldest place on the, on the planet. And the internationally, it is governed by the International Treaty on Antarctica. There are several treaties. So we call it treaty system. So Antarctica is protected. And basically, there are over 20 countries of, uh, as original signatories. And as we say, Antarctica is very far away from uh, any habitable place uh, from the southern tip of, of Chile and Argentina. You need days and days of, uh, of actually going with, a, with a, a special ships on the rough waters. And even the southern tip of Chile and Argentina are not, uh, it's beyond the Patagonia and the, uh, uh, um, Tierra del Fuega. So it's far away from, from populated areas. But even from the southern tips of the Chile and Argentina, the, the, this little tip of the, of the Arctic is, is very far away. So it's, it's pre pretty far away. There is no traffic. There is no, uh, unless the explorers are going there, there is not much happening there. And as we said, it's very unapproachable place and it's the oldest place on the, on the planet of, of Earth. It's very uh, unhospitable. And there is no permanent life there. So uh, humans are having no settlement historically there because uh, the, the life of humans and most of other species is pr practically unbearable. Um, on contrary, the Arctic, the Northern Pole, is basically, as we said, it's a water surrounded by land. And uh, this is also permafrost since the temperatures are low. So practically most of the North Pole, when we see also when we observe the planet, would be white, but beneath it, there is no land, but there is only the let's say the, the sea, the Arctic Ocean, we call it Arctic Ocean. And uh, now comes the Norway. So there are five littoral states. When we talk about the land around Arctic, there are five states that are having this land that is coming to Arctic. The longest portion, nearly half of the land mass that surrounds all belongs to Russian Federation, to Russia. Okay. Then comes uh, 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 Canada and United States on the other side that are also having access. Canada has a vast um, northern portions of the country that are exposed to Arctic with the Hudson Bay and the rest. And as you know, there was a so-called Alaska Purchase 
United States have bought some lands and there, there is a northern, northwestern tip of the northern portion of the North America that belongs, uh, when you see on the map, that belongs to United States. There is a discontinuity of territory. Most of the, or practically all of the United States territory has a territorial continuity. And then Alaska as a, one of the federal states, besides the Hawaii, has no territorial continuity. So you can't simply walk there. You have to cross Canada. And that constitutes, this portion of United States constitute United States as a polar state, as a state that is so-called littoral states that has a direct access to Arctic. And then another two countries are in Europe. This is Denmark that we mentioned before, not by its own position, but by the fact that they had Faroe Islands and the Greenland. So that constitutes actually big access to the uh, polar or, or Nordic circle uh, of, uh, of Denmark. And Denmark is uh, considered as one of the total states. And finally, we come to country of, uh, of uh, Norway. And Norway is also one of the five littoral states. So there are five littoral states and there are other interested parties or interested states, uh, them being uh, primarily Iceland and Finland, because Finland has no direct access to the polar uh, uh, circle. So there is no direct sea access to the, to the um, Arctic Ocean, but they are, they are uh, portions of the Lapland, portions of northern portions of Finland, the Lapland, where Lapons are living, where is the Santa Claus, you know, they consider um, Lapland as a homeland for the Santa Claus. Uh, so, and when kids are writing the, uh, let's say, letters to the Santa Claus, they are sent to the North Finland. So this portion of Finland uh, is actually also uh, above the polar circle, because polar circle is on a meridian scale is 66 uh, uh, degree. So uh, portions of Finland are above that, uh, as well as Iceland, although both of those countries are having no direct access, but they are considered as a polar, uh, let's say, uh, uh, or the Nordic, Nordic circle countries. But five littoral states are there. And as we said, it's Russia, it's Canada, it's United States, it, it actually Russia, and then Canada, then Denmark, then United States, then Norway. And there is a Svabald, one big island, which is co-shared. There is a special Svabald treaty uh, signed between Russia and Norway, and uh, they, govern, they govern jointly this, this um, uh, uh, territory. And the Svabald um, island, a pretty, pretty big island, with the uh, permanent, uh, permanently settled population. So there are originally people were not living there, but they are settlers who are from both from the Norwegian and from Russian side uh, living there. And that population is a couple of thousand, I'm not sure, maybe 10 or, or 12,000 altogether of the people who are settled there, but they are on a rotational basis. And Svabald is a halfway between the northern tip of Norway and the North Pole. So it's pretty much to the far. Uh, what is also a perception, especially of us in Europe and living in the uh, central or, or southern portions of Europe, uh, we consider we consider actually, uh, for example, Switzerland, where UMF is situated, or Austria, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, we consider this as a as a central Europe. So usually you would say, okay, that the northern Italy and uh, 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 southern France, Switzerland, uh, Liechtenstein, uh, uh, Austria, uh, Bavaria of Germany, that those countries are actually uh, Central Europe or, or the heart of Europe. They would say, okay, where do you live? I live in Munich, I live in Zurich, I live in Vienna, and this, or Budapest or Praha. And this is, a, this is a heart of Europe. This is the center of Europe, which from the geographic point of view is absolutely uh, incorrect. When you take, uh, really, when you draw the line from Malta, which is the southern portion of or Sicily or Greece or Cyprus or Ibiza and uh, uh, De Mallorca. So when you take those southern portions of Europe and when you see to the north, where is the Europe actually, the middle of Europe would be Denmark. 
would be Copenhagen or somewhere between Hamburg and Copenhagen, this would be a heart of Europe. Why? Because it, it gives you an, an idea, an impression, how huge actually northern or Nordic portions of Europe are. We are usually considering them as the end of Europe, and we are not aware very often of the, of the size. So practically, when we go from the northern portion of uh, Norway, uh, where is the border between Norway and Russia in the White Sea? Uh, so uh, when you draw the line to Malta, actually, or from Svabal to, to, to Malta and Cyprus or the south or Sicily of Italy, when you, when you draw the line, the, then the center would be actually not in Switzerland or Austria or in Bavaria, definitely, but it would be somewhere between the Copenhagen of Denmark and the northern city of Hamburg of Germany. So that would be the, let's say, the geographic uh, center of, of Europe, and they would be considering. So practically, that means that actually uh, we didn't know, but Austria and, and Switzerland are actually South, South European countries from that point of view. And uh, it's fascinating actually to go to the North. I had the pleasure also to, to travel and to teach in the North and uh, Europe and it's fascinating. Uh, it's completely different feeling uh, to to anything else. Uh, those white days or or, or dark nights um, because they are closer to the polar circle, and then practically in winter, you have absence of the real daylight. And starting from May on, practically you have um, uh, uh, a night. Night looks like um, there is a moon, moon comes up, uh, sun remains on the skies. And then the night looks like very cloudy day. So if you, if you want to imagine how in Finland or in Norway or in Iceland, a night during the you know, uh, summer, summer days, how day and night looks like. Imagine uh, when you walk uh, the streets in 12 o'clock in the day, and where, when, the, where, when the, the, the sky is very cloudy. So you don't have, uh, you don't have um, sun, but you have this shadows actually, and it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, let's say, less visible. So this is, this is to, to, let's say, to visualize you how, how the night looks like. And then of course, uh, the, even the, the wildlife has to accommodate. So the owls, you know, the, uh, owls are the night uh, night hunter uh, birds. They are also hunting during the day or during this what is supposed to be night, but it's still day. Uh, and then also, the, I mean, in the wildlife which normally lives during the day, because some animals are sleeping during the day and they are active in the night, and vice versa. So there, uh, everything is different. The vegetation is different, and uh, and uh, let's say uh, many interesting things are. Um, are taking place, which are different from the from the rest. So coming back to the road, to the Nordic uh, or, or the Arctic issues, so that constitutes Norway as a very important country. It's a net oil exporter uh, country. It has um, uh, its own sovereign fund, and it's very interesting how they are governing, let's say, uh, the wealth of, of of their natural resources, and also. Uh, it has a direct access access to to Arctic. It's a it's a, a European country. It's a member of uh, OSCE. It's member of Council of Europe, and it's a NATO member. So it's one of the uh, 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 let's say funding members of the NATO, uh, and has uh, of course a, a very long uh, tradition of uh, seafaring. So uh, this like let's say Britain or France or. Spain and Portugal, or the Arabs, or Indians, uh, who are also very experienced nations in the seafaring. Uh, those are, let's say, so-called fish of the Volm Sea. Norwegians, Danish, and the Russians, uh, primarily those three nations, they are champions of the, of the seafaring of the cold seas. And uh, uh, primarily Norwegians, uh, who with the Vikings most probably have reached the uh, Northern America and have um, uh, managed to, to, to have uh, even permanent settlements in Northern America. So there are a lot of um, there are overwhelming evidences uh, of, uh, of the Norwegian or European presence in America before Colombo.
uh, and also including the permanent settlements. There are also some calls, uh, some 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 evidences that are indicating that the Chinese were also circumventing the globe. But it seems that uh, the the Newfoundland and the northern portions of the United States and the uh, central to uh, southern portions of eastern coast of Canada have been penetrated, visited, explored, and also settled by the by the Norwegians, by people from the from the Norwegian uh, uh, and Swedish or uh, to, uh, today's territory of of Norway and uh, to extend of uh, of of Sweden. Uh, so that means that basically there are centuries of of uh, sea uh, 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 wanderers and explorers that are coming from Norway. Uh, Norway has very good uh, Arctic equipment, has icebreakers, and all this becomes very interesting because uh, due to the uh, uh, global warming, uh, there is an opportunity to open so-called Arctic bridge. Uh, Arctic Bridge indicates actually the uh, alternative uh, sea uh, passage, sea lane, which would be connecting the Far East, the places of uh, manufacturing of goods uh, that is primarily indicating uh, portions of Japan, of South Korea, of China, and their ports that are shipping goods, you know, via Strait of Malacca, via South China Sea, Strait of Malacca, Indian Ocean, Red Sea through Gibraltar, or circumventing Africa, coming to Gibraltar and then to Rotterdam, Trieste, or going over uh, French uh, and the Benelux and um, um, uh, lands and the territorial waters to Rotterdam, because Rotterdam is a, is a European port number one, uh, and Genova is number two, which is in Mediterranean. So practically uh, relaxing those lanes, which are anyway very crowded, and shortening the voyage and also cheapening uh, 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 the voyage of the of the bulk of the goods of oil. Uh, so they, uh, the 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 ideas of using Arctic Bridge, so going basically from from Japan not down to the East and South China Sea, but going further to the north, actually over the Bering Strait, and then the Arctic Ocean, following actually the line of the coast, of the northern coast of Russia reaching Norway and then going down to Rotterdam or, or to Britain or to Sweden and Norway. So that becomes more and more interesting and it shortens the voyage time up to 40%, if I'm not mistaken, 32% of 40%, uh, 32% of, uh, of time and 40% of the, of the gasoline. Because uh, as you know, the tankers, the, 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 the cross oceanic uh, shipment goes with the very large big ships and uh, 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 to the present degree of, uh, of uh, let's say, of our transportation mode, we, we haven't invented anything which is not carbonic. So we have to use diesel fuel for uh, those ships and those ships are practically uh, uh, exhausting, uh, exhausting CO, uh, CO2 into, uh, uh, as a negative emissions. So that means that basically, uh, uh, if you are uh, serious about uh, greening of the planet, then we have to we have to uh, consider this Arctic uh, Arctic Bridge, and also it um, the the other uh, alternative the other road uh, the other route uh, of uh, uh, using the the Arctic uh, Ocean would be going from the Hudson Bay. So those are the the midlands of Canada and uh, shipping the go goods to, to Norway or to Russia. And imagine uh, basically that it does not go uh, with the horizontal line as we see the map, but it goes vertically. And it's also a very short way. So that puts Norway and especially, especially Russia into, into a new considerations and uh, into a, let's say, new sort of spotlight. And coming to Norway, uh, back to Norway, actually, um, uh, Norway explores uh, uh, the hydrocarbons, be it gas and oil, uh, in the North Sea, and uh, as, a, as we said, has a uh, historical, long historical expertise uh, when it comes to the um, exploration of the cold seas, of, uh, of polar issues. Uh, 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 fundamental research has been done, and, and it's uh, encompassable, you know, so, so practically when you have centuries of, of experience and when you live also in the cold place, 
so so you can master it differently from from many others but also uh, what is interesting and what is um, a study case for people is uh, the, the let's say the, the the territorial dispute uh, uh, between Norway and Russia and the way how they handle this territorial dispute unfortunately in the press and in media you get always um, a lot of news about something which escalates into open conflict but very few times you have in media uh, let's say uh, much of the coverage to the positively resolved issues and one of the uh, positively resolved issues is this territorial dispute in the white sea of the uh, between Norway and Russia and this is uh, definitely an invitation for many to study to see how basically conflict can be solved although both parties are uh, also security wise sensitive Norway is of course very sensitive on Russia uh, there is uh, uh, so that means the geopolitics is in play, security is in play. Uh, who controls uh, what waters? Who can come close uh, to each other? And also, there is a there are huge mineral deposit um, on the seabed and elsewhere. And uh, so that means that the stakes are very very high uh, uh, of bo uh, 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 to both parties, but still. They have settled. They have settled in a very uh, peaceful and uh, and let's say in a pacific and constructive manner, and that definitely requires. That definitely uh, let's say uh, invites uh, researchers to study to study that case. So that's that's basically uh, uh, on 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 Norway. Some some things that uh, I'm sure that most of you have not uh, uh, known before. So just to, 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 to let's say, to, to sum up, uh, since we are getting to a three o'clock and in case that actually Excellency got it wrong because I think they are in different time zone. So we can wait for a few more minutes and if they don't connect, we will see uh, how to organize this event next time. Uh, so basically uh, just to sum up, so uh, Norway is the Nordic country it's uh, to the very north of uh, European continent, is a country that have been uh, negotiating accession to EU, uh, have fulfilled all criteria and uh, have been uh, accepted by all member states of uh, EU when the EU was still in, in the Maastricht time in the early 90s when the EU was still uh, 12 countries, not 28 or now after exit of Great Britain 27. Uh, but they, they rejected themselves to join. Uh, Norway um, uh, lives um, independent uh, life uh, in the modern history sense uh, around 100 years uh, so far, 109 years uh, to be precise. Um, when they had the so-called, uh, the, the, let's say, the peaceful or Pacific divorce uh, with Sweden, uh, because um, uh, they've been they've been uh, in one country. Uh, it's a constitutional parliamentary monarchy, which means that um, head of state is a non-elected monarch. It's a royal family, and it's a parliamentary constitutional monarchy. That means that they have a parliament and elected government. And our today guest was actually heading this government in two two two, two terms. Uh, it's one of the five littoral states that have a direct access to the Arctic, to the North Pole, and uh, is, a, is a member state uh, to uh, the Council of Europe, which is the uh, eldest uh, multilateral institution in Europe. Uh, then the second important institution is OSC, its Organization for Security and Cooperation, which um, has appeared in Europe after the Helsinki Treaty of 75, and it deals with security and cooperation. It has so-called three dimensions. And uh, as we said, uh, they um, uh, negotiated accession to, to the EU, but basically they rejected. But still having said that, um, uh, Norway is a part of the Schengen zone uh, uh, as an EFTA country. So EFTA countries are countries that are not directly in the EU but they are facilitating trade and commerce and the transborder, uh, let's say, um, uh, tariffs and trades and transborder 
regimes. So basically they are linked through EFTA and Schengen agreement with the other countries. And Norway is also subject of Nordic Union in which actually there is a so-called Nordic cooperation countries that are of, 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 of Nordic. So, so, so Norway is a member of, of course of the UN. And Norway is also very, uh, what I was not mentioning before, Norway is a country that uh, that is, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say, a good guardian or good shepherd. Um, Norway is a uh, region big enough uh, to be concerned over the world issues and to follow world issues, but on the other side, is not uh, too big to be mistrusted because very often when you are big, when you are a really large country like Russia, like India, uh, uh, like China, uh, Great Britain, or United States, for that matter, or France, or Germany, then uh, it always triggers mixed feelings with the, with the smaller neighbors. So, so per definition, if you are too big, you are not much trusted. And as a big country, you have uh, special interests, you have um, uh, special attachments, um, the, the, the considerations are different, and usually it follows with the huge armies, and therefore, uh, therefore, big countries are having their own considerations, so they can't really truly look for the peace and stability in the on the planet. So the Nordic countries, together with Switzerland, I must say, are having this uh, ability and this appetite and this sensibility to be good uh, guardians and good shepherds. Uh, so the Swedes and the Norwegians, uh, in a way, also the fin Finnish uh, Finland. Uh, 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 with the Switzerland, were champions of, of negotiating and mediating different conflicts. And you will recall so-called Oslo, Oslo Accord of 93 between the Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, this conflict, which unfortunately escalated uh, recently, also again, uh, especially in Gaza and Eastern Jerusalem, because of denial of uh, to enter into Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, was uh, was was turning back to the issue of two so, two state solution and many other things and and that have started actually in Oslo, when Norwegians in a very let's say uh, discreet way approached both sides and started negotiating. That was unfortunately not in the end successful, but not because of Norwegians, but because of the parties of Fitzek Shamir and parties of uh, Palestine. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but our guest is here. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, Prime Minister, are you here? Excellency. Excellency, are you here? So Oslo Accord, I mean, we will be waiting uh, uh, him for a second. So Oslo Accord was, was broker 93, and just to say, uh, on one side, uh, uh, basically, uh, both, both parties were neg negating existence of the, each other. So the, the traditional Arab line was actually Israel has no right to exist. And on the other side, Israelis were telling, okay, we need extra security. We are in a hostile territory and we see Pal every Palestinian as a threat. And when you have, usually when you have a conflict, then the parties say, okay, we agree that we disagree. We can't reach agreement, so we go to the third party to, 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 to broker agreement. And that was, for example, issue of, of Tyrol, uh, the, the South and Tyrol, which Hitler was giving to Italy, Austria was claiming, so Austria and, and Italy were not coming to any agreement. There was a terrorist activity, was unbearable life, but both parties have said, okay, so we, we turn to, to Hague, to the United Nations uh, 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 Tribunal, to solve the issue because we agree that we disagree over everything. And this was a solution. But in a case of the Israeli Palestinians, both parties were negating that the other is even party. You know, and that was the that was the heavy, heavy issue uh, 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 with the with the, let's say uh, with the Israeli Palestinian conflict, which have started to defrost the first achievements, the first fundamental breakthrough has been has been achieved in, in Norway, which then culminated at that time with the with the with so-called Oslo Accord of 93. Okay, Excellent. I'm here. Excellency, you are here. Yes. 
Uh, we are so sorry. I think we had misunderstanding with Miss Roberta. So we've been waiting you for one hour, but doesn't matter. We are so happy to have you. Okay, here I was informed that it was uh, three o'clock Central European time and two o'clock Greenwich time. It's 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 absolutely okay. We are so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, uh, our assistant already read your CV for two times. So if you don't mind, we will just open floor with you uh, so that we don't read your CV for the third time. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay. And uh, I am. Uh, I was talking for nearly hour about Norway. Everything. Oh yeah, I, yeah. Know I, about I heard the last uh, ten minutes. So uh, about the Oslo. <laughs> it was interesting to to hear your assessment of Norway's international role. Okay. So um, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I will go. Uh, will go on. And please, um, please, please. I have. Um, Floor is yours. Yeah, I, I've been asked to, uh, to to speak about democracy and human rights as a basis of lasting peace, yes. and uh, I understand that after that the floor is open. Excellency, do we see you? From... I'm not sure. Do we see you? Yeah, I, I see hope. you, and I see you, and I hope that you can see me. Okay. Yes, okay. we do. Yes, we do. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Okay, so I go on talking about uh, democracy and human rights as a basis of uh, lasting uh, peace. And, uh, and I will also give examples on how the Oslo Center, where I am the founder and current uh, executive chair, uh, how we are working in this uh, field. Um, uh, as background, you know that I have been engaged in uh, domestic and international politics uh, for many years. And I am after that more and more convinced that lasting peace uh, depends on real democracy, on human rights, and in what I will call inclusive societies. In authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, there sooner or later uh, will um, be an uprise probably also violent. It is consequently of great importance to work on developing and stabilizing more democratic states all over the world um, for good governance, for human rights and uh, the rule of law. And we are especially working within the framework of the UN development goal number 16. That in fact is about this. Over several years after 1990, there was a substantial increase in number of democracies. Unfortunately, over the last three, four years, there has been a fallback, a decrease of number of democracies. And in my view, this is also a threat to peace and stability. But in the perspective of the last around 30 years, it has been substantial progress for democracy, but also for human rights uh, in a global uh, perspective. In my view, there are especially two important dimensions of how to save democracy, peace and stability, also now after uh, COVID-19. Um, one is to build up strong political democratic institutions that are sustainable and not depend on only one or few strong political leaders. And secondly, uh, to create more inclusive societies where different groups, political, religious, ethnic, women and youth, really are included. The civil society must be strengthened. We know from research that especially young people who feel to be excluded from the society are those who most import easily are recruited to extreme and violent groups. Inclusion is consequently a key word for peace and for democracy. 
It is a challenge how to build up frameworks where everybody can feel included. It has to do with how we organize local communities, NGOs, political parties, and so on. During the COVID-19 period, it has been raised a debate about national responsibility and institutions versus international cooperation and institutions. It is no doubt that every nation has responsibility to take every pre-condition um, step to be able to meet challenges as pandemics and other international crises. But we have also experienced that we will not be able to do that without a stronger international cooperation. Uh, in other words, strengthening, not weakening the international institutions and cooperation. So some more words about human rights and about democracy. We know that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This is the basis of all, our, of all our efforts for human rights and democracy. Abuses on human rights and authoritarian and totalitarian regimes are enroachments of human dignity and will consequently sooner or later lead to uprise, revert, and also possible violent conflicts. The elaboration of the human rights principles was rooted in the French Enlightenment movement, in the American Declaration of Independence, in the anti-colonialist movement, and in the post-Nazi catharsis in Europe. But the thinking also have roots in Chinese philosophy and in religious traditions, not specifically Western. We have to move on from the history of ideas and philosophy and place human rights in a contemporary political context and in the context of human experience and become much more worried about their universality. And this is where I come to the first of two challenges or dilemmas that I will, uh, which I will comment on today. First, the disconnect which exists between human rights as international discourse and on the other side, the political praxis, which is also linked to the issue of double standards. There are two facets of the disconnect. One between the discourse of the UN, the Western governments and academics, and the experience reality of, for example, political dissidents, human rights activists, or ethnic minorities in oppressive states. The other facet of the disconnect between discourse and praxis is that which can be seen in regimes that are good on rehearsing the human rights discourse. They have in fact successfully co-opted it as a smokescreen for systematic human rights violations. The pure record of efforts to strengthen human rights in a large number of countries and the absence of human rights in the lived experience of so many people is a reality. Real is also the risk that human rights are seen to be relevant and feasible only in mature democracies, where power holders can be held accountable. Otherwise, it may only be seen as a theoretical construct and theme for international conferences. In my view, 
the universality of human rights is fundamentally about a correspondence between discourse and praxis. As a result of the gulf between them, where we may be facing today is a moral crisis or a crisis of credibility for international human rights. We need effective and credible assessment tools of the implementation of human rights internationally. The UN Human Rights Council, uh, the descendant of the Human Rights Commission, was, as we know, established in 2006 to provide exactly that. Many of us had high expectations to what the broadly composed council would accomplish. However, it remains to be seen whether Human Rights Council universal periodic reuse can contribute to the credibility of the UN in this regard. From what we have seen so far, there is still a way to go. What can make a difference, however, is the effective prosecution for human rights abuses. Hence, ongoing trials at the International Criminal Court, ICC, is important steps in the right direction. I mentioned double standards. It may well be argued that the US and Europe have lost credibility as promoters of freedom, human rights and democracy. And there are many examples. The plight of the Palestinians that I heard the professor commented on, the hesitation of Western governments to confront political allies with allegations of human rights violation and military interventions as in Iraq are examples. I was prime minister of Norway when we had the crisis in Iraq and can come back to that if you would like. 9-11 created a new kind of fear and massive security measures have put human rights under pressure. It changed the way human rights are perceived. We have seen examples of human rights violations in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib in the name of the quest for freedom and fight against terror. President Obama chose a different approach. He extended an open invitation to dialogue with the Muslim world. And this was, in my view, a wise approach. But there was a lack of follow up. And the response from important Muslim countries were not as we hoped for. And I am now really wondering how President Biden will uh, tackle and manage this situation. Will he reach out the hand as his, as his President Obama did to the Muslim world for a dialogue? Or will he make the confrontation policy as his predecessor, President Trump, did? The Alliance of Civilizations high-level report states that the perception in Muslim society is that the lack of solutions in such international conflicts is a result of what we call double standards in the implication of international law and protection of human rights. When Muslim countries are invaded by Western military forces. To be consistent in promoting human rights and building confidence means uh, and building confidence means no double standards. If we are criticizing human rights in one country, we have to apply the same standards in other countries. If we deny one country the enrichment of uranium, we have to do the same with others. 
This is true even if one is considered a friend and the other an enemy. Hence, we are looking at another discontinuity which threatens to undermine the universality of human rights. The one that exists between what we do in one place and what we do in another. Double standard. Double standards reflect political and economic interests, we, we know. They reflect that we have different interests in different places. We can argue that the foreign policy based less on interests and more on values would make it imperative to treat countries in the same way, according to the same value-based set of criteria or framework. The Universal Dem Declaration of Human Rights provides such a framework. And so in my view, do universal notions of human dignity enshrined in the world great religions. And I have been engaged in several interreligious dialogues and have experienced that. All states should guarantee the freedom of expression, of information, of association, religion, and the right to education and health. It is precisely these freedoms and rights that may allow societies to change from within and to incorporate universal human rights values. I also want to point to another challenge to, uni to the universality of human rights that springs from the sometimes conflicting interests between reconciliation, peace and human rights. This is a dilemma that we live with almost every day. And that is somehow built into the work life of any center that works for peace, democracy and human rights, as for us at the Oslo Center. I do not, of course, have a ready solution to this dilemma, but I want to point to the need to address in a discussion about the universality of human rights, the inherent dilemmas and morally difficult choices that sometimes have to be made between human rights and peace. Any peace or reconciliation process requires compromises. These compromises can, for example, be seen to undermine minority rights. In the Balkans, for instance, where greed, minority rights may threaten the peace accord, the dilemma has been turned around. There are also sit um, situations that sometimes make it imperative to set justice aside for the sake of the peace. The peace process, for instance, involving the so-called Lord Resistance Army in northern Uganda and the demands of impunity for its leader, Joseph Kenny, provides a telling example of these dilemmas. So the policies of peace may sometimes threaten the universality of human rights and justice. This is the dilemma. However, we also know that in the long run, human rights form a bridge to peace. A society lacking this bridge will easily revert to internal conflicts, which in turn place human rights under immense pressure. I strongly believe in the universality of human rights. But I also believe that we need to address the social and political realities that undermine their universality 
and critically assess our own discourse and how well it corresponds with reality. We must relentlessly strive to bridge the gap between words and realities, see through false discourse and disclose the application of double standards. If we do, we can make a real contribution to, to the universality of human rights. So a further elaboration of um, democracy, which is the main program field for the Oslo Center, where I'm the current executive chair. Democracy is a consequence of the fundamental value of human dignity. And it's interesting that human dignity is mentioned before human rights in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Every human being has a right to influence on the society where they live up, in locally and national, uh, nationally, nationally. There is no clear international recognized definition of democracy. But there are some main principles that must be implemented if we should define a regime to be democratic. Free and fair election, division of power between the legislative, executive and judicial bodies, and respect for the fundamental human rights as freedom of expression, assembly, associations and religion. Fortunately, we have compared to 30 years ago, got many new more or less democratic states in Europe, in Asia, in Africa and Latin America. We at the Oslo Center are engaged in several projects in our order to contribute to develop and to stabilize democracies. And I will draw upon our experience in my further elaboration. We say that we shall contribute to responsible leadership in fragile states and weak democracy. Responsible leadership is leadership by example. Exercising a commitment to dialogue and political cooperation and promotion of human rights and democratic principles. Fragile states and weak democracies are to be understood as states that are vulnerable to internal conflicts, that are characterized by political, ethnic and religious divides and weak states policies and institutions and or states where democratic praxis has yet to gain a stronger foothold. We will do this by providing context sensitive advice to political leaders, parties and government apparatus on power sharing, on coalition building and enhancement of a culture of dialogue and cooperation based on democratic principles. We will further provide documentation awareness raising and competence enhancement on international human rights standards, obligations and instruments to political leaders, the government apparatus and the judiciary, and providing meeting places and facilitate dialogues. Extensive leadership experiences from politics, experience-based knowledge of the nuts and bolts of political cooperation, and a broad international network are among the Oslo Center's advantages in this regard. Fragile states, states with high levels of internal conflicts or states in a post-conflict situation with weak state policies and institutions will often have a unstable coalition governments, where power is shared between political parties and actors in a power sharing arrangement. Such coalition governments may well be the result of political compromises and deals to end a violent conflict and often lack a common political platform. 
Generally speaking, fragile states and weak democracies often have a short history of political cooperation and democratic governance. In such states, strong group interests often constitute platforms for political mobilization, nonpartisan civil society organizations, and weak, and the competence and resources to develop political solutions that gain broad support are limited. In many volatile political situations, cooperation between the parties to a power sharing arrangement is also the sole guarantee against recurring and violent. Such cooperation may also be a precondition for successful post-conflict reconciliation. Efforts at enhancing political cooperation in divided and conflict-ridden societies are, therefore, a means to conflict prevention and to reconciliation. Our work towards democracy involves many different actors. It is support um, is to support such development as I described. For a great change, single initiative can do little, but with a joint effort, a coordinated effort built on collaboration, we believe that accomplishment can be made. We are at the Oslo Center moving forward in um, projects in countries as Kenya, hopefully also now Somalia, where we have been before, probably in Uganda, in Northern Macedonia, and in Georgia, where we can identify the need to both facilitate coordination as well as creating mechanisms supporting collaboration. As a small organization, we are working from the privileged north. We recognize the need to anchor the work in the form of partnerships with other bigger organizations. We believe that our partners are the key to success. Partners also that work on the ground and can identify the areas of need. Areas which we at the Oslo Center can attend to by offering both advice as well as help create arenas for dialogues. Concrete, we work with the main political institutions uh, in a democracy, and that means the political parties, the governments, and the parliaments. This triangle is a key for every democracy, political parties, government, Parliament. But we also work with the civil society, where we have a strong tradition in Norway uh, as an important part of our democracy. And in the civil society, we have concrete projects in several countries on uh, youth and on women, and empowerment and encouragement to them to take part in public life. We share principles and our experiences from political work in democratic institutions. For instance, on questions like what is the role of politicians and the role of the parliament? How to cooperate between parties and politicians? How to reach consensus on important political matters and compromises in others? How to work in a coalition government? how to develop a constructive relation between government and the opposition, and the relations between the tri democratic triangle, as I mentioned, parties, parliaments, and governments. We also assist authorities in drafting election laws, political parties laws, and constitutions. And we have faced some challenges in our work that I want to mention. Namely, in several countries, also in Africa, we have a culture of what we call 
the winners take it all. That means that if a party or a group win an election, they take all the positions and exclude others. Um, and so we have to emphasize that democracy is not that the winners take it all, but it also is about taking care of interest of minorities to create the culture of inclusiveness. We have also experienced in several countries where we are working that ethnic conflicts is a strong conflict dimension that makes democratic political work much more complicated. We have experienced dissimilarity in participation in political work between men and women and inequality between the two sexes in general. And we have also experienced tensions linked to religious differences. Let me end up by saying that it is a work about developing good governance. And that is essential for legitimacy. It is essential for making citizens trust politicians and the political system as a whole. A country which is good governed is open to words, debates, and to the people, free from corruption and gives people progress in their lives. In essence, democracy is about to share power and to respect the will of the people. Listen to the will of people means listening to all the citizens, not only those that has elected you. Strengthening democratic institutions is essential. There is a clear link between strong democratic institutions and governance capability. Democracy is, as we know, not just about putting a list in an election ballot box every third, fourth year. It is a continuous and ongoing process. It is about building democratic institutions developing a democratic culture and democratic praxis. It is about continuous political and public dialogue. It is about a vibrant civil society with good conditions for political participation. In my view, good governance implies and relies on responsible leadership, on political leaders' willingness and commitment to develop political pol politics that bridge differences and build social cohesion. This is all about what I will call to build shared societies, inclusive societies. In many contexts, this boils down to relations between a majority population and minority groups. Yet experiences underline that inclusion of minorities is a challenge for most communities, indeed also in our part of the world. But it is also a litmus test for the quality of any democracy. Without a certain level of trust between people, between leaders and between people and their leaders, no democracy can thrive. Hence, good governance is indeed also about executing politics that strengthen relations across ethnic, religious, political and culture boundaries. Under such circumstances, I would argue that dialogue is not only a meaningful tool, it is perhaps the only tool to build better relations between communities across regions. It's a tool for building shared societies. If there is no interaction between people, with people on the, what shall we call, the other side of the river, one's worldview is seldom challenged. In a dialogue, people can compare notes, share explanations, share experiences, confront each other with alternative frames of interpretation. This is why dialogue works. 
Dialogue can turn out to have a real and radical effect because it challenges the very self-image and worldview of the other participants. A well-facilitated facil dialogue can potentially lead to a shift of focus from mutually excluding and non-compatible positions to a formulation of shared interests. This is also an experience of the peace efforts where Norway has been involved that we can come back to. It can make the participants realize that they have common interests, not only different in interests, such as economic development, quality education, safety, and improved job opportunities. Such a shift is a starting point and a prerequisite for peaceful coexistence. So to conclude, respect for human rights and democratic principles is a, for me a consequence of human dignity. This is also the best way to avoid uprise, rebellion and violent conflicts. We know historically that democratic states seldom start war against each other. Consequently, respect for human rights and a functioning democracy is in fact conflict prevention peace work. Peace rely on human rights and democracy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Excellency. It was very inspiring, uh, inspiring and uh, uh, content intensive. I'm sure that participants enjoyed uh, as much as I did myself personally. It, uh, it's a brilliant, actually, uh, an overview and the lecture on what truly democracy substantively is, and not only what uh, what the textbooks are telling. And uh, definitely, Norway, Norway is a champion. While we we've been waiting for you, I was uh, mentioning a couple of of issues, and um, there are a lot of questions. Um, uh, uh, once more. Um, to apologize to our viewers who were waiting for one hour. We simply had a, uh, apparently a misunderstanding over the time zone. So Excellency understood that it's a Greenwich Meridian time, uh, two o'clock, but uh, we meant uh, Central European time, but doesn't matter. Uh, we have already received a lot of questions. Uh, some are corresponding with what I mentioned while we, we've been waiting for you. Uh, so uh, uh, leaning on the Oslo Accord, so at that time you've been you've been uh, you've been in Parliament and uh, uh, in the government. So when the Oslo was was in making, and I explained them in short why Oslo was significant because uh, those two parties were negating each other to be a party. Once you have two parties that are disagreeing or this uh, compromise, the arbitrage is achieved. It's not that difficult. But in that case, uh, neither party was recognizing each other. So your quick state, uh, your your quick uh, um, uh, take on on the current situation and on the significant departure from what Oslo spirit has created uh, by '93. Actually, even even earlier. So today's reality and this Oslo spirit and this departure, if if I may so. Yeah. You but prefer three you... questions or just one, one by one? Okay, I, I take it uh, immediately. Okay, uh, please. Yeah, to, to be brief, um, a precondition for uh, successful uh, talks and negotiations are that um, uh, the facilitator are just uh, trusted by both parties. And I think Norway got that position through an NGO that was working in the region for several years and they got confidence on both parties, on both sides. And that's why they could play an instrumental role. And gradually it was left over to the Norwegian government. That was the same experience in uh, countries as um, Guatemala, maybe which that is the most successful Norwegian peace negotiation. In fact- Sri Lanka was also, correct? Yeah, Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka was not that successful, I must uh, admit, because it ended up uh, as a military solution, not a negotiated solution. But Guatemala but they, is the most but successful. But they turned to you, they turned to Norwegians. Yeah, they turned most to cases. Norway, and they also did so in the Philippines. Uh, yes. But, but uh, Guatemala is the most successful. Um, the Middle East, uh, the, the Accord, the Oslo Accord, it's not a a finally settled peace agreement, unfortunately. It was more like a roadmap. 
uh, describing the way forward and pointing out all the main issues that should be negotiated. Unfortunately, this has not been followed up as it was described in the Oslo Accord. I talked very much to President Clinton about this because um, he was president when I was prime minister and he made his last efforts during his last months as president at Camp David to try to settle a final peace agreement. He failed. Well, I will say the parties failed. Uh, and, uh, but they were very close. And he summed it up in a way, he was saying, you never get the peace solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians without a solution on Jerusalem. And that's what we also saw now in the, in the, in the current conflict. And you never get the solution on Jerusalem without a solution on the holy sites of Jerusalem. So that where you are to the core of the conflict, and this is not solved. So now there is, there is a lack of confidence between the parties, unfortunately. So there are no real talks between them. And the problem is, of course, as the Palestinians are divided into two, the power between Hamas on the uh, Gaza and, and, and the Fatah on the West Bank. It's a very difficult political so solution, uh, situation within Israel. So there are very bad conditions for negotiations for the time being. But I do hope that one day it can be better. And then they have to negotiate all the main issues that were described in the Oslo Accord, namely the refugee problem, the borders, uh, and last but not least, Jerusalem and the holy sites. These issues must be negotiated if there should be a lasting peace. Uh, thank you, Excellency. You mentioned before Iraq. So since we, we talked about Middle East, Iraq, so what is your take when it comes to this no trust uh, between the parties and this early uh, confidence building measures through the third mediating party? So what would you, say about Iraqis, but also about Afghanistanis, because in Afghanistan is also failing. And there is no there is no this, I mean, failing when it comes to, to confidence building. So there are unfortunately separate talks, as you know, far better, separate talks of the government, which was a heavy blow for the peace process. Yeah. Uh, and, and then let's say the discontinuity between the, the governments of United States that both parties are identifying as important uh, broker. As you mentioned also in the Palestinian yeah. Israelis, in the end, they trusted that Americans can enforce this. Yeah, I was prime minister both under uh, Afghanistan conflict and Iraq. And um, we have some common experience from these two conflicts, but they are also in the starting point, very different. Um, uh, the common experience is that a military intervention very seldom is a real solution. But uh, with re regard to Afghanistan, I will say that Norway and several other countries, we had no choice. We had to contribute to the military action because it was an attack on an ally in NATO, on US, uh, the September 11. Uh, and uh, the um, paragraph five in the NATO treaty will immediately come into function, namely the, um, the common solidarity, and we have to, to respond in solidarity with the member countries concerned, as we did. And it also had a mandate from the UN Security Council to act. With regard to Iraq, it was completely different. It was no NATO country that was attacked. US was, and uh, UK were, were not attacked. And they had no mandate from the UN. As we re uh, remember, it was a disagreement in the UN Security Council, German and France against uh, UK and US. And we from Norway decided not to join that intervention. And uh, President Bush called me a week before the intervention and asked me to join. And I said, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, or fortunately, we can't do that. And I said, of two reasons. First, you have no mandate from the UN. You are not attacked. You have no mandate from the UN. This is not uh, in accordance with international law. And secondly, more from a moral uh, point, uh, 
Um, use of military means must be the very, very last solution after you have tried to use all peaceful means. And I said, you have not done that because uh, uh, inspectors of weapons of mass destruction ask for more time. Why not give them? And we know that Iraq was a big failure, big failure uh, in my view. And, uh, and uh, we see it now afterwards. But the situation in, in Afghanistan is also difficult. Now, uh, the US and Norway and others withdraw our troops from Afghanistan. We are, we are very concerned what will happen, but I will say at least there have been some progress in the country. You have political parties now that are functioning. The rights of the women are better. Situation for education is better. Uh, but we have been there for 20 years and the experience is that military interventions very seldom is the solution. Uh, yeah, you mentioned at that time exactly. So France and even Turkey opposed. Turkey, Turkey forbid actually fly over the territory, and Chirac was there. I don't know, was it Tansu Chila who was the prime minister at that time in Turkey? I can't recall, but doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm uh, not quite sure now. No. Uh, if but but it was Chirac. No, I, I think, think it was Erdogan who was the prime minister. Now he's the president. Aha! At that time he was. Yeah, yeah, he was already he was already a prime minister. Uh, uh, if 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 the parties turn to you to your peace center, for example, Afghan parties, what what I, I know it's a hypothetical. What would be your approach? How would you how would you talk with them? Because Taliban's are reality. So whatever happens in Kabul with the government, there is still no confidence and there is no there is no direct talks and negotiations. Actually, but, nearly one party excludes the other. Yeah, I have two uh, experience of similar situation. Let us start with um, with the Guatemala that I mentioned. That yes. was uh, in the time when I was Minister of Foreign Affairs. And they came to Oslo and we managed to bring them together in the same meeting room uh, for the first time for many, many years. It, it was very high tensions, but we did it in the first meeting in a very informal way not in a conference, in a meeting room, but in a, in a dining room. You mean separate rooms or together? No, both together, <clears throat> but bring them together in an informal setting, in a dining room where you can have a good meal, you can have coffee, sitting uh, uh, with the, the, the fire, talk in, uh, together, not about the conflict, not starting with that, talking about Norway, Oslo, families, and so we could uh, reduce the tensions, uh, the human tensions, and bring them together. And then the next day, they were more ready to, to come in a meeting room and discuss the conflict. And I remember that uh, I had the opening statement as a foreign minister. This was about Guatemala, and it ended successfully after six years negotiations. Um, I think the same with regard to um, uh, to Israel, Palestine, and the Oslo, leading up to the Oslo Accord, they started very informally at a guest house uh, outside Oslo, not in the Oslo center, but outside Oslo, where people could go out and walk around the house, talk together about the nature, about Norway, about their families. And so gradually, after some days, they were able to sit down in a meeting room, starting to discuss. Uh, the difficult issues. So for me, it is about primarily uh, building confidence. Without confidence, it will fail. You have no chance. But if you can gradually build up confidence between the parties, between the uh, negotiators, then you have a chance. So someone calls it uh, mini-lateralism. I think Willy Brandt, when he was a, 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 a mayor of Berlin, he was introducing those little steps, like communal issues, you know, no big politics, but small steps, confidence building measures, human to human communication, or as they call it today, minilateralism, not multi, but minilateralism. Yeah. And of course, no publicity. I think Oslo was prepared with, with, without any publicity. It was nearly secret in a way. Yeah, it was secret in the beginning. And <clears throat> another precondition, another, um, advantage for Norway when we are doing such uh, talks and negotiations is that we are a small country. I think you mentioned it yourself. 
um, the other countries are not afraid of Norway. We don't, they don't expect that we have uh, economic interests. We are there just to try to contribute, to facilitate and negotiate. Uh, and we have, um, it starts very often with non-governmental organizations. That's also important. We also uh, facilitated peace talks in Sudan between North and South. And that was at the end of my term as prime minister. And uh, they ended up with a peace agreement in 2005. It started with Norwegian uh, non-governmental humanitarian organizations working on the ground in Sudan. And they got confidence on both sides and they brought them together. And so they came to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and asking us to take over and we did. So using NGOs as an instrument is very often successful. So are you approached by, by Afghanistanis? I, you mentioned about Iraq, but have you been approached so far? I mean, if you can say, if you can disclose this. So are you talking about the Oslo Center? Yes. Yeah, we are approached now by Afghanistan because they have asked us if we can uh, contribute to um, uh, facilitate dialogues between political parties in Afghanistan uh, in order to help them to organize themselves in a democratic way and to uh, how to cooperate between the different political parties and how to cooperate in the coalition uh, where I also personally have much experience. I have True. been a member of four coalition governments of Norway sharing two of them. So. Um, it, it now depends on the conditions and uh, on the funding, but probably we will uh, be engaged in Afghanistan in future. Uh, thanks, Excellency. And what is your take on, on, on Iran? I, I was just this morning uh, uh, walking uh, uh, by the Grand Hotel uh, uh, in the city center of Vienna and, and, and you see all this uh, uh, charade with, uh, with the resumed talks on, on Iran and also some demonstrators outside of the of the of the building so so there are different uh, voices and different views of course americans apparently are nervous uh, to 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 keep a, a hold on of um, of tensions uh, between the palestinians and israelis primarily because they are concerned of of, of iranians going nuclear as we know they have a, a credible delivery systems they have separators they have they use dual use technology they negate, of course, but nearly delivery systems and dual use technology is there. So, uh, but some are telling that the fair approach to Middle East, as you said, without Jerusalem and holy sites, there is no peace. Uh, how about uh, the approach which is simple, but tough, which says, okay, the denuclearized Middle East. Is that, yeah. a, is that, is that realistic, first of all? Not in the and, short, and not what is in the end? What is the future of 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 Iranian nuclear talks? I mean, what is your take on that? Yeah. Well, the uh, I and the Oslo Center we have been engaged uh, with regard to Iran through a project we had with former President Mohammed Khatami. Um, uh, he was uh, a theologian as myself. <laughs> he was a Muslim theologian. I'm a Christian theologian of education. Uh, he was president when I was prime minister, so we met in a meeting in Geneva uh, on a big uh, international interreligious conference. And we stepped down as leaders about the same time, around 2005. And he founded his uh, center in, uh, in uh, Tehran, I, uh, the Oslo Center. And we um, uh, started to, to make a common project, which we called Islam and the West. And uh, the main uh, focus was what do we have in common in the Islam and in, in the West? Say the West, not the Christian world, because uh, Western is not specifically Christian, but we have other religions as well. And we, what are the differences and how can we learn to live peacefully with our differences? How can we use common values to mobilize for reconciliation and peace? And it was very interesting. It brought me three times to uh, Tehran. President Khatami was uh, uh, twice in Oslo and we met also in Geneva. We had conferences about religion and politics, about uh, equality and women, about extremism. It, it was very interesting and we made common statements from all these uh, conferences. 
Uh, I think primarily this has to be also, as we said before, about trust building. Without confidence, there will never be a solution. Um, so the only way is to start a dialogue as, as we did. And I really, he became my friend. And uh, now, unfortunately, in fact, he is in house arrest and they have closed his foundation. But he was a dialogue oriented man. He was a reformist, but they have this stupid political system with the, the Council of the Guardians that stopped more than 90% of his reforms that was, were approved by the parliament. So that's another story. But the only way is now that President Biden reached out his hand as President Obama did. And hopefully there can be a positive response on the Iranian side that the negotiate, I know that that is going on now, negotiating a, a new agreement with some adjustments uh, from uh, the Obamas. And, and that can pave the way, hopefully, also for Israel-Iran, maybe not under the current leadership of Israel, but another one. Uh, so they can also have talks with Iran that they can gradually build up some confidence. And, and in this way, you can hopefully get rid of, of the nuclear weapon plans of, uh, of Iran. And in a later stage, hopefully, have um, a nuclear free zone in the Middle East. I see on the screen now that there are coming up questions also from students. May be they should reading some of the of, of those questions uh, so thanks uh, uh, for for this um, I mentioned also the the white uh, sea uh, 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 a territorial dispute between Russia and Norway as a model how to solve the issues although they've been uh, from security geoeconomics geopolitical uh, a point of view very sensitive and very let's say uh, um, um, uh, heavy but it was successfully sold. So, so maybe, maybe also a few words about this. Uh, since uh, in, in many circles, it is not much known and we are publicizing things which are negative, not much the positive case uh, uh, cases. So if you can say it, a few words. About the Norway-Russia relations? Yeah, yeah, the dispute on the White Sea, if I'm not mistaken. It was, a, it was actually the on the, the territorial dispute over the, the, the sea, the demarcation on the yeah, sea. Yeah, yeah, that's right, in the Barents Sea, yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Well, um, it's a long story, of course, uh, how these relations have been developed, but in, in, in general, I will say that there are friendly and good relations between uh, the Norway, a small country, and Russia, a great power. Uh, and it goes back, of course, to the, to the Second World War, when we had the common enemy, and uh, where Russians also helped Norway to fight uh, the Nazi, Nazis and, and, and Germany at that time. And um, so we got the Cold War after the Second World War between the West and the East. And that was, of course, Norway came in into a squeeze in a way. Member of NATO, US as our strongest ally, but on the other hand, a rather long border with Russia and uh, so we had to balance all the time but i think that the russians realized that norway is protected by nato and the us so i think they gave up any ambitions they may have to to, to try to 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 um, attack norway they realized that that will make a third world war so um, therefore, I think I think they took the consequence that we have to live friendly with our neighbors in the West. Uh, we have common interests. You mentioned the Barren Sea, petroleum resources, fishing resources, other natural resources up in the north. And we started to develop people to people um, cooperation in different fields. And Russians visited Norway and vice versa. Uh, people up in the north are very friendly to the Russians, uh, and I think the same on the other side of the border. Um, and, uh, but of course, sometimes there are tensions. And the main reason for tension was, as you mentioned, uh, that the border in the Barents Sea uh, were not settled, finally settled. Um, we negotiated over many years, also under my time as foreign minister and prime minister. And gradually, from two different starting points and principles, 
uh, the so-called middle line or the sector line. Uh, we understood that we had to find a compromise between them. And after many years, we did. Both parties saw that we, we should not go on with this conflict. Now we should solve it because there are so many natural resources up in the Barents Sea, both fisheries and petroleum, that both countries um, had an uh, advantage of, of making a final uh, line. Because as long as we hadn't that, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't um, explore the resources in the conflict area. And that was a rather big area. Mm -hmm. So that was a common interest. And as I said before, a common interest, you have to focus on the common interest to find a solution. And we did finally. So it was also it was also the the let's say the the Swabal Treaty is also one of the of the of the longest serving treaties between those two countries. Yes. And both actually also this territorial dispute is one of the best examples how disputes should be solved. Absolutely. In a re reasonable and also implementation was taking place. We have we have the arbitration between Slovenia and Croatia, but nothing has been implemented. And in many other cases, the Philippines mm. and South China Sea, in many other cases, we have legally very successful stuff, but actually there is no implementation because either of the parties or both parties are then giving the interpretation and, and they, are not, uh, they are not ready to implement. I think in case of Norway and Russia, it was negotiated in a reasonable and fair terms, and it has been implemented, as you said. Uh, on the screen, one of the questions is uh, your role in the in the Club de Madrid, in the Madrid yeah. Club. So that's one of the questions. And of course, COVID, because, you know, that's a buzzword, you know. So what is the world after COVID? Yeah, we can't escape this, although I personally do not like to talk only about this. But that's one of the questions from, from okay. the screen. Okay. Club de Madrid um, is an organization that uh, was founded, I think, in the beginning of, uh, of the 2000s uh, and, uh, by a um, Spanish uh, philanthropist uh, together with others. And it is a club uh, of former, more than 100 previous uh, former presidents and prime ministers. Uh, I'm one of them. And um, the, the main mission for the Club de Madrid is uh, democracy. Uh, we have a slogan called democracy that delivers. And uh, the main idea is that we who have experience from democratic countries and democratic praxis uh, should share this experience with current leaders in countries that have vulnerable democracies. And uh, so we have different projects and programs in, in, in that regard. We have one that is called Shared Societies, which has to be you know, of interest to me, where we talk about issues that I had in also in my uh, presentation. And we, we, we meet leaders in the other countries and talk about how to make uh, living civil societies, young people, women, others engaged, uh, how we, we develop democratic political parties and institutions and so on. And I think it's a very good idea that former leaders who are still engaged can use their knowledge and experience to convey to current political leaders. And it's uh, very well welcomed in, in several uh, countries. Um, I was also for um, uh, two terms member of the board of, uh, of Club de Madrid. Despite we are more than 100 members, I will say that really active is about one third of these uh, 30, 40 members are rather uh, active. Of course, we have had challenges under COVID-19 as all other organizations. We couldn't meet physically, we have, but we had, had uh, the, uh, several virtual uh, conferences. And, uh, and now we are going to have a general assembly during the fall as we have every year and a conference linked to that. Uh, Excellency, one of the questions is, is related, of course, to COVID, but uh, uh, essentially well, uh, there is a feeling that, uh, that the responses to, 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 to COVID-19 was compromising some, some of the fundamental human rights or democracy at large. Uh, so what is your take on that? Maybe it's more specific than to talk generally about the economic renewal after COVID. Yeah, I think that... Um... Uh, it's a special challenge for democracy now during the COVID-19 period because 
we know that um, some countries may be uh, leaders who have authoritarian tendencies have used this opportunity also to strengthen their position and to uh, grab more power. Um, and, uh, and that, uh, for instance, in Norway, they have been very eager now, the current leaders, that parliament must be involved all the time. Of course, we have to give a stronger mandate to the government to take quick decisions that is necessary in such a crisis, but they should inform and involve the parliament as much as possible. And also the legislation that has given the government more mandate, stronger mandate, is given by the parliament. Uh, so, um, but we know that it's not a, a good uh, practice in, in all other countries. And I'm really uh, worried about the situation after COVID-19, if we can see some countries that use the opportunity through this COVID-19 to grab power, to have more authoritarian uh, way of, of ruling the country, and that will not go back to a more normal democratic situation. And this is one of the challenges that we already have started to discuss in Club de Madrid, and which we will do also in future. Mm -hmm. So that basically the, the, the government is not running by decree, but that, that everything, even the quick decisions uh, are endorsed later by the parliament. Yeah, and the, or the, that the full that democracy it, is reintroduced. Yes, that uh, they are approved by the parliament after uh, afterwards. And the laws that has given this enlarged mandate to the government, these laws are given by the parliament. Yeah, so it has to be returned to parliament. Uh, the neighboring, your, your southern, southern and, uh, uh, and eastern neighbor, Sweden, uh, had, a, had a policy of no lockdown. Uh, and uh, how, how it was corresponding in Norway, so because you are the neighbors and also historically... Yeah, yeah. it was discussed in Norway because we saw that Sweden had rather different approach and not the same lockdown as in, in, in Norway. And, um, well, it's up to every country to make their own policy, but we were very little bit surprised. Uh, of this, and uh, we see also that the numbers of of people who died during the COVID nineteen is much much higher in Sweden, much higher. Also, when uh, compared to the population of the countries, um, but they had their own uh, view on this, and uh, they were saying sometimes that they will create a stronger immunity. Toward, uh, against the COVID-19, but as far as I know, the experience is, is not that good after. Uh, and they have a lively discussion in Sweden as well now, if they had the right approach or not. They have another tradition also in Sweden that, uh, compared to Norway that we should be aware of. Because in Norway, we are used that, to that politicians make all the main decisions in, in all fields. In Sweden, they have stronger what shall we say, administrative institutions that have a stronger mandate to take decisions on behalf of, of the people. Than like we have political culture, a bit different yeah, political different culture. Different political culture, where we in Norway make all the dis main decisions uh, by the politicians. In Sweden, more decisions are taken by administrative uh, institutions. Also and in the health, health yeah, system. Yeah. And it's also expectancy of population to get that, in a way. Pardon? It's also ex the, the expectations, expectancy of population that they will be provided with such. Yeah, I think it's you less right. participation than in Norway. Yeah. yeah. So basically, bottom line, you, your idea would be Parliament gives uh, those uh, extraordinary powers, but it has to be returned to Parliament again. Yes. Yes. So that's that's basically your message when when it comes to democracy and, and COVID or post-COVID uh, uh, time. Yeah. And right. dem democracy was in recession, correct? Even before pandemic. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was. If you think globally, yes, yes, absolutely. And we can mention some European countries uh, which are to great concern in that regard. We have mentioned Russia, um, but I will also say Poland, Hungary, Turkey, uh, so it, it was a matter of concern even before COVID-19. But I'm afraid that this tendency has been strengthened during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's extra, extra work to do. Uh, I see that one student is uh, raising his hand. 
Uh, well, Sam. Yeah. So, so the the fact that time the time keeping questions myself is actually that we lost one hour. So usually when people are referring, then then they are taking longer time. But we can open the floor. Uh, I have two questions uh, related, uh, which usually I put to, uh, which we usually put to the end. But it's not bad to to mention them now. Uh, since I don't know how long we have reported for the Zoom meeting, so I'm, I'm, I, I fear that we could be cut with the, with the Zoom. Uh, Excellency, I think Norway is excellent, uh, excellent country and an idea, even if you want, uh, to study. So what would be your, let's say, uh, tip how people can study, travel and, and even stay in Norway? Of course, given, given the, the situation, the health situation has been has been restored. And secondly, if someone wants to work for your center or with your center or study on the activities of your center, what they should do? What are the steps? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, in, in, in normal situation, we have uh, very open borders uh, for um, workers and students from other country. As I know that you mentioned during uh, your talk before I came into <laughs> because of uh, the time misunderstanding. Uh, we are not members of European Union, but we are a member of the European Economic Agreement. And that means that we are included in all free freedom, uh, for, for freedoms, as it is called, for the single market. And that is free movement also of people and workers and students. And, uh, and uh, workers can apply for uh, labor in Norway for a job. Uh, and we have rather many now, for instance, from countries like Poland. Uh, they can also apply for um, for uh, come to the universities as students, and we have rather money from different uh, countries. Um, but uh, and with regard to the Oslo Center, we have normally two or three students as so-called interns working with us. Normally they are from Norwegian universities, but from time to time we have also from other countries. And for uh, the time being, we have, for instance, one student from a university in, uh, in Paris, in France, and we had also in the previous semester. Now, unfortunately, these students couldn't come to Norway physically now, but uh, they, they are linked to us all the time uh, with meetings, uh, virtual meetings. And uh, if they want, they can go to our website, uh, oslocenter.no, and, uh, and uh, they will find information on how to apply to be uh, an intern at the Oslo Center. Normally, we take uh, uh, students who are studying now and working on their master degree. So they can write thesis on your activities also? Yes. Now we have uh, three students for this semester, but we will take new ones uh, from uh, August, September. So they can write to us now. And generally, so so if you want to study and to 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 write about Norway, so the first station would be the the cultural attaché of the Nor Norwegian embassy or the Scandinavian embassy. Depends yes, you can. Uh, you can. Uh, that's a good idea to go there first. But you can also. That go would be the, the first step in a way. Yeah. But if you're interested in the Oslo Center, especially, you can go to our website. Yes. Uh, click there and find uh, information and, and write to us if you are interested in to be an uh, intern uh, at our center and hopefully that can be also physically from, uh, from the fall, from Houghton. And also to write theses, the master or the PhD theses on the, on, yeah. on the topics that, that is you... Not, that is not under our responsibility, that is under the responsibility of the university, university concern. Yes, yes, yes. But they can work with us uh, in addition to that. Yes, yes yeah, yeah that, that's what I meant. So they can also go to Svibald, to Svibald because this is the, the most northern university. It's my yeah, yeah, dream yeah. to go okay. there. I was never there, but I would yeah, love yeah. to at, give a lecture at, there. Uh, at Svalbard, at Spitsbergen, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's under Norway. It's a Norwegian university, correct? Or it's uh, Sval shared Svalbard with... is a part of Norway, yes. Yeah, but I mean, it's uh, the university in, in Svalbard is run by Norway, not by, by Russians. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's run by Norway, yes. It's a Norwegian yeah. university. Okay, okay. So it's uh, a halfway, again, for, for the participants. It's a halfway from the northern tip of Norway uh, to the to the North Pole, so that's that's the roughly the position of Svalbard. Uh, and your take on Arctic, because you know the the R five would R R five A five 
include indigenous peoples. I yeah, don't always can... have no issue with indigenous peoples that much, but what is your take? Well, we have um, one indigenous uh, group in Norway, and that is the Sami people. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And um, of course, they have been fighting for the rights for many years. And uh, I think the Norwegian society was not aware enough of, uh, of uh, the differences and, and their situation, and they felt discriminated for some years. And it was especially a conflict about building out the water power up in the local community of Norway. I think it was in the 1980s and 90s, and I was member of parliament at that time. I remember very well. Uh, it was Alta River, uh, and but they lost that uh, fight. But it raised the awareness of the Sami people uh, in the Norway, in in in, in, in uh, among common people of Norway. And we got a new law that was in my time as a prime minister about uh, the rights of the Sami people. And uh, we established the Sami parliament. Uh, and they have, of course, some limited power. They have to act within the Norwegian legislation and, and so on. But uh, we have an own law for the Sami people and for the Sami parliament. And we have given them more rights. And I think now the situation is calmed down and and uh, and uh, it's a good uh, rather good situation now uh, you have some people also in other nordic countries and uh, yeah, Finland primarily yeah and, <clears throat> and we have uh, we have shared experience with the governments of the other nordic countries in 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 that regard and this is an important dimension of the arctic uh, uh, situation and we have also an arctic council as you know and the minister of foreign now, affairs summit, yeah, yeah. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Arctic countries, among them Canada and US, uh, were gathered now the last uh, weekend. Yes. And um, also the, um, the US Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, they met for the first time yes. Yes. within that framework. And that I think was useful not only for the Arctic uh, issues, but for the whole situation. And uh, on, on Arctic Bridge, what is your take, Scott? Is there, is there let's say, visible and uh, realistic uh, prospects of the Arctic Bridge, be it connecting uh, Western Europe with the Far East or with Canada? Yeah, in a longer perspective, it may be, yes. Uh, but I think what is greatest value for the time being is more people-to-people -people projects up in the Arctic region, that is, and, and the cooperation about the natural resources, that is, of course, of great importance for the Arctic uh, Cooperation and Council. And finally, when it comes to Arctic, Arctic Treaty or UNCLOS, what would you say? Arctic Treaty or? Or UNCLOS, because we have Treaty on Antarctica, but there is no Treaty on Arctic. Yeah, I, w I would... So what would uh, you say? I think we should have Arctic Treaty as well. Okay. Thanks. So maybe, but but please be concise. Maybe we can take now physically some of the of the questions. Uh, uh, yes. Because I was a bit nervous uh, that uh, the Zoom could uh, could uh, simply uh, disconnect us. No, we have a time for the Zoom. I understood. Yeah, yeah. Not, it's good. not limited. Yes. Very good. Very good. So. Uh, now, if, if uh, some of you are having questions, be, please be concise. Mm, okay, in the of law, can I ask? Yes. Introduce yourself uh, shortly and put the question. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Qasim from Afghanistan, Dunya University, first semester international relations. I have a question that, uh, uh, as uh, Mr. Prime Minister mentioned that uh, democracy uh, need a triangle, that to one side is government, the other side is human uh, rights, and the other side is parliament. I, my question is about the human right, that uh, how we can bring human rights in a country or in a, uh, in a society that uh, maybe there is a uh, backwarded country or not. And uh, my question is uh, especially about human rights that 
how we can bring human rights in our country or uh, maybe in other countries as a uh, diplomat or uh, other other works. Thank you uh, so much. Well, when I talked uh, about it, maybe I talked about two triangles. <laughs> the one is peace, democracy and human rights. Uh, peace uh, rely on democracy and human rights. But when I talked in uh, about the triangle in a more um, political context, I talked about political parties, parliaments and governments, political parties, governments and parliaments. Uh, but how the main question was how to bring uh, human rights to countries like Afghanistan and, and others. Well, uh, it's not a quick fix. It takes time. It's a question about uh, developing a culture. Uh, uh, human rights culture, but I think education in schools uh, is important. Every pupil from the very beginning of their education should learn about human rights. The U UN Human Rights Declaration, uh, the UN uh, Human Rights Conventions, we have different conventions as you know. Uh, the other important thing is to establish human rights institutions in the country not only an official human rights commission established by the government and under the government, but independent, really independent human rights uh, institutions. That uh, I think is a precondition and, uh, and also human rights non-governmental organizations that can um, focus on different human rights issues. Uh, in Norway we have, of course we have Amnesty International, we have something called the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, that is focusing on the human rights situation in Eastern and Central Europe. But we also have uh, human rights organizations focusing on the human rights situation in our own country, in Norway. So that is a key to bring human rights to, to more countries. Thank you, Excellency. So maybe we have still time for one, two questions. Don't be shy, use the opportunity, introduce yourself, be brief. We covered most of the questions uh, anyway, so I, I tried to read and to compress them. Okay. Yes, please, please. Introduce yourself shortly. Yeah? You hear me? You hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh, my name is Sultan, I'm from Germany. And uh, Norway is one of my favorite country in this planet. I have been more than 25 times. And North Norway is a beautiful, small paradise. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, once I meet a Norwegian family in Middle East, uh, I'll ask them that you got a beautiful country. What is the reason that you live since five years in Middle East? And the answer has really surprised me. The mom was crying and said, because of my children. And the Norway have very strict law because of children. And any time the child children or the government can take our children. Not a just one family, sir. I meet more than five families in different country from Norway. That surprised me. What, what, what a prime minister think about is that bring some changing for the future or the st strict law for Norwegian families inside Norway. Thank you. That was my question. Okay, I, uh, I hope I understood you correctly. If not, you must um, intervene and, and correct me. But I understood that the question is about Norwegian law that makes it possible for um, a children uh, official institution in Norway to take the children out of the family. Uh, is that right? Yeah. But that is under very special uh, circumstances and conditions. Uh, because children have the right to be protected. And of course, normally they are protected by their parents in the families. <coughs> and that's how we want it to, to be. But sometimes there may be mistreatment of children in the families. And if uh, the local uh, family authorities get information that a child is mistreated in their own home. Um, it may be also violence. Uh, it may be big alcoholic problems in a family that uh, makes a very difficult situation for children 
under very strong conditions, they are allowed to intervene and take the child out of the family for a limited time or for a longer time, depending on the development. So there are, of course, it's, it's very difficult and sensitive to practice this law, very difficult. And sometimes uh, they are claimed that uh, the, the authorities are misusing their power. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes you get the opposite criticism that they should have intervened in a situation and did not. So it's very difficult, very delicate. But I think there are broad agreement in Norway about the main principles for this, about, uh, about uh, the law, uh, but the conflicts come up about how it is implemented and practiced from time to time. But we know that we also have a UN uh, convention about, uh, uh, about the rights of the children. And that is the basis for both Norway and other countries. Uh, thank you. Rola, you, you have a question, correct? Yes, please. please. Um, thank you, Your Excellency, for the interesting lecture. Um, my question goes back to the issue that you talked about, about the universalism and of, of human rights. And I just wondered, wanted to ask you, like, how can we ensure that universal human rights are observed while at the same time being like context sensitive and not perceived as just imported from the West? Like what, what role does the center play in ensuring that? Thank you. Yeah, this is a very important question and not easy to answer <laughs> because you are right, there are very different uh, frameworks for implementing human rights. And uh, that's also my experience from our international work that we can have different understandings. We, we, we agree on the UN Declaration on Human Rights. Most countries have ratified uh, and also the different UN uh, human rights conventions, the rights of children and, uh, and uh, civil uh, human rights and uh, economic and cultural human rights and all the other conventions. But, there are different frameworks that are different cultures and they are differently implemented. The only uh, answer I think I have is dialogue again. If we meet and discuss how we implement these uh, human rights, that's the way forward. Uh, that we not live in isolation and practice them in very different ways, but if we can come together. And that's also a main idea about uh, the UN Human Rights Council uh, that followed the human, UN Human Rights Commission. The, the commission didn't work actually. Uh, I think the council is working a little bit better, but it's not perfect. And every country, uh, there is a, what they call the REU, human rights REU on every country. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a written report from uh, the council secretariat to the council and every country is discussed in from time to time frequently in the council and i think this will help to create a more common understanding of what human rights are about excellency just ne next to uh, the last two questions uh, so basically do you believe that the uh, the 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 helsinki accord or actually the osc principles would be applicable also to conflicts in the middle east yeah, because I mean we have three dimensions, as you know. So, so, yeah. so it's the first dimension is the military, uh, it's political military cooperation, but also third dimension as well. And we have environment in the second. So, so practically all is there, and there are also partners. The Mediterranean partners are there as well. I mean, Afghanistan is also Mongolia, uh, Korea, Japan. They are also members. I mean, they are associated Asian group members. Yes. You are pointing to a very interesting uh, issue. I, I think there are I mean, some- why, sh why should we, sorry, why should we invent warm water when, when there is something there already? I, I, th I think that uh, the Helsinki Declaration and the principles there and the follow-up through first what we call CSSE and now OSSE uh, are to some extent relevant for un other conflict-ridden areas in the world. I was participating at an international conference about the Korean Peninsula recently. And I think to get North Korea out, out of isolation and to get dialogue between North and South, as we had for some time, but not now, and with the US, with China, Japan, and so on, some of the principles from the Helsinki Declaration could be relevant 
we know that in the heads in the OCC cooperation we have we have some uh, different baskets we call it security uh, human relations economic uh, cooperation and and these could be used also as a framework uh, and approach in other conflicts on the North, on the korean peninsula but also maybe in the middle east uh, because we have to create new ways of approaches because the current <laughs> has not worked coming coming back to the middle east uh, would you agree that there is a deterioration of the of let's say human rights and even the equality among genders since so called arab spring yeah it has been arab, arab spring turned into a winter in yeah, a yeah arab spring was uh, promising and and i think we many of us had really expectations that we we that now things would happen there uh, because we have had waves of democratization in other parts of the world and so we got the arab spring and now we thought thought that we should get a new wave of democ democratization uh, around the mediterranean uh, but unfortunately it, uh, it it came fallbacks and uh, uh, and now it's uh, i think maybe the only country that has had some democratic progress is where it all started namely in in uh, Algeria, so um, um, we have to to rethink how we should approach uh, democratization in uh, also in uh, in the Mediterranean Arabic countries. Uh, since you are clergyman, so, so uh, since you are of the of the clergyman training, and uh, interreligious uh, dialogue is close to your heart, mind, and also your previous uh, activities. Uh, do you believe that for Middle East or for the Muslim world, one of the key questions is, is to reconciliate Islam and modernity? Yeah, that's a, I would say it's, it's because, not because you know, so equality among genders, all those issues are yeah, yeah. coming back to the fundamental how to reconciliate tradition with modernity and Islam yeah, that's being what, a fundamental that's, part. that's one of the dimensions. I will not say the only, but it's, it's a part of, uh, of uh, the picture. And that was interesting also when I had, uh, as I mentioned, the dialogue with former President Khatami of Iran. Uh, he's a clergyman, and at the same time, he was a politician. And uh, the gender dimension and uh, the question of Islam and modernity in general was a part of our discussion. And we found big differences, but we found also some ground of, uh, of common uh, interests. Uh, thanks a lot. So maybe last, last, last uh, question from the audience. Since we are anyway coming now to to a close, if we still have one one question. So Norway and the EU. Do you see any prospect of Norway? <laughs> well, I participate getting to referendum. For, I don't know, for we the had referendum time. in uh, in uh, seventy two. We had referendum in ninety four. I participated in both in seventy two as a youth politician, political leader, and in seventy four as uh, ninety four as a party leader. Uh, uh, and you know, it was a majority against at both occasions. There is no upcoming debate about that now. In fact. I think most Norwegians find uh, our solution with the EEA agreement, European Economic Area, as a good solution, both economically, so we have no economic needs for, needs for being a member, but also as a, um, a, a way of compromise uh, politically in our country, between the eager uh, Europeans who want the full membership and, between, uh, and, and those who are deadly against <laughs> The European Union, EEA serve as a compromise, and uh, and uh, so I don't think. Well, now we saw that the UK left the European Union. I, there is no strong voices now in Norway for joining the European Union, but maybe in some years it will come a new debate. So but, Iceland uh, also remains on on your line. Iceland also remains on on the same line. Yeah, they seem to remain on the same uh, line, and of course this is a. Uh, balance between uh, having some influence as member on the one hand that we don't have, but on the other hand, we have more freedom 
uh, with some, in some domestic political issues and uh, also with regard to foreign policy. And, and on, on Russia, so is it counterproductive? I mean, this new wave of, of, of let's say, collision course, is it counterproductive for Europe? Does, does this confrontation serve uh, European oh, yes. interest in the end? It, it is, absolutely. It's counterproductive. I do agree. So how would you see this in future? The, because if, if any deterrence towards China and, uh, and let's say Confucian overproductive uh, East is there, then West needs Russia. I mean, it's like a simple puzzle. So they're alienating Asia, primarily Chinese uh, dominated Asia, but also Russia. Yeah. And West is in a relative, in a relative economic and demographic decline. It's not getting I, up, I, getting I, down. I see that in, in this regard, um, EU is important because EU is a strong political power. And we have to balance up the power of Russia and, uh, and China, and also in a way the US. So in that regard, I uh, acknowledge that EU is playing an important role. And this is also an argument, of course, for Norway to be a member, to contribute in this regard. But uh, the domestic political situation in Norway is uh, such that I don't think it will come up in the near future. And if you see the programs now that are uh, approved by the main political parties on their congresses, even the, the parties that normally is in favor of membership, they don't raise the question for the time being. Okay. I think we are, we are getting to a close. Uh, we are coming to the hundredth minute of, of talk with the prime minister. Thank you, Excellency, so much. And just to recap, uh, we can say that conflict is what you get and the peace is what you are fighting for. So yeah. peace is something that you have actively to work on. And um, each and every segment of society has to be aware and has to contribute to it, not to wait something peace to come by someone else. Uh, so so uh, this is as on, on my side, uh, besides the many thanks to you. Uh, again, uh, apologizing to all the patients audience uh, for waiting uh, for the, this uh, misunderstanding over the time zone, since we are in a, a, a Zoom meeting. And Excellency, thank you so much. I hope that you will be able to pay a visit to Geneva. I know you've been many times to Geneva. I hope that you will be able to see the new campus of university, which is really a um, uh, um, uh, breathtaking place to be and to have formal and informal setting as well. And also to use it as a, as a good, uh, let's say, uh, uh, confidence building uh, a measure place because it has a beautiful garden in Chateau and uh, it's on a river road. So I think everybody gets very, uh, let's say, uh, soft when, when spending a couple of hours there. But definitely to, to pay a visit and to, to give a, a lecture of fauna in Geneva uh, sooner than later. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Professor. I uh, appreciate it to, uh, to participate uh, at this conversation, uh, despite it was virtual. I also apologize for the misunderstanding with regard to the timing, uh, but uh, next time we will be even more specific on that. Uh, and um, and uh, I, I would uh, absolutely and be open to, to participate uh, more times, uh, either it be virtual or even better physically, of course. And I like Geneva. I've been there many times at, uh, in different frameworks. I would like to come to the campus and, and speak directly to, to you and to the students there. So uh, I'm now also sitting, I can mention to you, maybe you see from the background that is rather informal. I'm in my summer house two hours south of Oslo, where we have really been living for the last uh, months, <laughs> yeah, partly because of, of COVID-19, because so much is closed uh, at home. So we are here, and uh, but we can work from here as we uh, have experienced now. That's uh, not a big problem. So um, thank you so much. I wish uh, you as professor, staff members at the university and the students all the best and hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. For the audience, uh, study and Thank travel so to much. Norway. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Bye. Thanks a lot. We think differently.